Hi, I'm Jackson Crawford. I'm an Old Norse specialist who, for more than five years, has now posted a total of more than 600 free public videos on this YouTube channel concerning topics that are underserved <laughs> or poorly served um, in, in the public eye. Old Norse language, uh, Norse mythology, runes, things like that, where uh, academics have been reluctant to crawl out of their ivory tower and present good information to the public, and the people who do present to the public tend to be crazy, angry gurus who think they're God. Uh, <laughs> so I, uh, I am an academic, but I am willing to talk to the public, but I also definitely don't think I'm God or that you should listen to me about most things other than Old Norse. Well, one video that I made very early in the history of my video channel was about how to use an Old Norse dictionary. All right, so there have been several versions of my Old Norse lessons on this channel over the years. Currently, I'm in something like the third generation of those videos. I think they've reached something like Lesson 25. Um, and as people get to know more Old Norse, of course, one of the best things for them to do is try to read Old Norse on their own. Right, pick up a saga or an epic poem, perhaps, that they want to comprehend and start working their way through it. But to do that, of course, since no one's ever going to learn all the vocabulary of a language, uh, they need to use a dictionary. Now, there is no perfect dictionary of Old Norse. Um, you know, that may seem like a pretty obvious statement, but the fact is that no matter which one you're using, there's always going to be something left to be desired with it. Currently, at the University of Copenhagen, there is a huge project going to create a new dictionary of Old Norse prose. Note that doesn't include poetry, so this would cover things like the sagas, but it is a long way from complete. Although it does now have Old Norse wordle on it, so I guess you can go try that. The, to this day, best and most complete dictionary of Old Norse is by Richard Cleesby and Guthbrander Vigfusson, although if we're being just, we really ought to say that it's by Guthbrander Vigfusson and Konrad Gislason, um, who did the, the lion's share of the work. Really, most of it reflects the eccentricities of Guthbrander Vigfusson, who had a lot of finicky, persnickety, particular ideas about what constituted proper Icelandic or Old Norse, and also what constituted proper English, and yet, also, for someone that persnickety about grammar, looked for all the world like he was about to break out into Plush or some other hit from his album Core. Uh, this dictionary is called an Icelandic English Dictionary, but it is really a dictionary of Old Icelandic, that is, the classical form of Old Norse in which the sagas, Eddas, etc. are written. Um, for some reason, this always gets people upset about, like, well, what about Old East Norse? Well, there is no dictionary of Old East Norse. There's barely a fraction of what's written in Old West Norse and Old East Norse, so live with it. You know, if you're going to read Old Norse, you're going to be using tools dedicated mostly to Old Icelandic. This dictionary is well out of copyright, so it's available in a lot of places online. Personally, the... Uh, platform that I've tended to use it for something like 10 years now is at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, it has some pretty imperfectly OCR'd pages, but uh, most usefully you can actually look at the, the scans of the dictionary as pictures too. Um, and I think that's the best way to do it because there's a lot of different formatting things and um, a lot of citations of different languages that, that show up best. It's just a straight scan from the 19th century book. This dictionary's format is pretty similar to that of other dictionaries. One might even call it the sort of landmark dictionary of Old Norse. So um, others have tended to follow its lead. And if you can use this persnickety, flawed, but pretty monumental dictionary, you can probably use any other dictionary of Old Norse. What I'm going to do in this video after this long-winded introduction is talk to you about how to use this dictionary and by extension other dictionaries of Old Norse effectively. Thank you. 
So a couple general warnings at the outset. As you use the Cleesby Vickvison Dictionary, be on the lookout for very archaic English. Guth Ronder Vickvison and probably Richard Cleesby for that matter um, were, you know, pretentious 19th century academics and favored pretentious English. Um, so, for example, um, you know, the word spiria, which means to ask, you will actually find translated as spear, which is some archaic English dialect's word for ask that is cognate with the Old Norse word. Uh, this is um, outside of <laughs> what you'll find in most dictionaries of English today. So you have to just kind of be ready for these things. Um, the OED can be helpful in deciphering CV. I'll, I'll use that abbreviation because you because in CV English. Um, you'll also find a lot of, you know, thou art and crap like that. Because, um, you know, nothing against Shakespeare. Um, but there was a... Uh, well into the 20th century, there were a lot of academics who liked to render ancient languages by using archaic English. Other places where you'll see archaic English, uh, let me just give you some particular entries uh, that have problems with this. Blake Holder you'll see defined as adjective auburn. Auburn used to mean something like blonde. Right now it means something like reddish brown. But because auburn is the older freaking meaning, that's the one that Guth Brander decides he likes. That's what this means. So you have to be ready for that kind of thing. Or look up a word like logi, which means flame. You see logi, and then ah, that means that that's its generative singular ending, so that means that you know this is a weak masculine noun. M, standing for masculine. Square brackets is um, etymological, etymologically related words, cognates. He gives a German and a Danish cognate here. And then he defines this as a low or a flame. Gives us a uh, example, brenna loga, to stand in a bright low. Now, low, L-O-W-E, meaning flame, is an English word that is not even in the dictionary on my desk. But, because it's etymologically related to the Old Norse word, he's going to prefer it to saying flame, the word that everyone who speaks English understands. Right. Pretty frustrating. And then, some of his translations too, he gets some particular fixations going. Like He's one of the first people that I can think of who fixated on the idea that Old Norse Blor didn't mean blue, but black. So when he defines, for example, uh, Blor some hell as black as death, he's sort of starting off this, this, this ball that's been rolling for a long time of people who think that Blor means black and not blue, which, um, starting with my dissertation, I have done a lot of work to try to uh, dispel, because I believe that's a myth. Blor does mean blue. Now, the CV dictionary like most dictionaries of Old Norse, not all, but most, uses Icelandic alphabetical order, which is different from what you would expect uh, going into it with just experience using dictionaries of, say, English. So some critical ways in which it's different are especially the fact that the long version of a vowel, that is the vowel with the acute accent mark over it, is treated as a different letter from the short version of the vowel, which doesn't have the accent mark over it. That means that uh, AZ comes before long AB, right? So you have to be ready to think of those as different letters with an exception for long E, which the CV dictionary doesn't treat as separate from short E, probably because there actually isn't that much long E in Old Norse or Modern Icelandic. As to other letters, the letter ed follows d, although notice that ed doesn't occur word initially, right? It's never the start of a word in Old Norse. So um, that mostly comes up in looking for uh, the internal parts of words. And then at the end of the alphabet, you're going to have thorn, ash, and u, right? O with two dots. Now, because this is based on modern Icelandic conventions, the i umlauted version of long O, which I write as long O slash, and um, many other editors write as an OE ligature, is included with ash. So entries will hint at the distinction, but if you find a word written with the OE ligature, or an addition by me, or, or a lot of Norwegian editors, the, the long O slash, you gotta look for it under ash. 
So, uh, for example, when you look up in Cleesby Vickerson, uh, E3, you're going to find it under A3, but it's going to say IE E3, showing you that it is, in fact, historically E3. Or you look up uh, Bur, you're going to find it under Bar, although that shows you some other regional or temporal variations, Bar, Bur, or Bir. But when you see an entry like Bok and see the plural listed as Bakr, you just have to know that there's no I mutation relationship between long O and Ash, that the I mutation of long O is long O slash or, or the OE ligature, and you're going to have to realize that this is really, quote unquote, really Booker. Why Guthrander Vickerson, who is so insistent on using ridiculously archaic forms of some words like Nekfer instead of Nokr, um, didn't distinguish between a eh and u. Uh, um, I, I cannot begin to explain. It doesn't make sense to me, except that maybe he was trying to be extra Icelandic, but not <laughs> making this distinction that Danish and Norwegian still make. Same deal with the u, uh, which includes both the u-mutated form of short a, which I read, and most editors write as o caudata, right, o, and the short o slash, the i mutation of short o. So the latter is much more rare, and that is the one that will be marked. So usually o with two dots by default will represent what most editors write as o cal data. But uh, if that o with two dots represents slash o, right, the i mutation of short o, that's going to be explicitly indicated. So ux, ax, you're going to see ie, ux with the o slash. While, uh, just to show you that that the okay, that is the default reading. If you look up uxel, right, like axel, uh, you're going to see that it's a feminine with the genitive oxlar, the plural oxlier. So you know if you've done any Old Norse that feminine nouns that have an A uh, in their oblique endings, like their genitive, the nominative plural, um, that that A is going to be affected by a U that used to be there in the nominative singular so that the nominative singular is U mutated, that would give you oxal, showing you that O cal data is what's meant by the O with two dots here, which is what you'd expect. All right, those are some initial <laughs> warnings. I'm gonna show you some specific entries and walk you through how to read them. Let me just uh, real quick here, give you a word from my friends, partners at Brent Frost. <laughs> So if you look up, uh, well, some some parts of speech don't require much comment. You know, a preposition has typically one form, maybe some variations, um, adverbs of one form. But if you look up inflected vocabulary, look for verbs in their infinitive, right, which almost always ends in a, uh, short a. Look for nouns in their nominative singular. Look for pronouns and adjectives and their masculine nominative singular strong if there's a strong weak distinction. All right, when you look up verbs, you may see some abbreviations in the entry about the verb that go E-N, E-T, E-M, E-U. What that's showing you is this is one way that this dictionary and some other dictionaries uh, will show you what case the direct object of that verb takes. So EN stands for Einhwern, ET for Eithquert, uh, EM for Einhwerium, and EU for Einhweryu. So they're showing you um, uh, an accusative singular, personal, masculine, uh, accusative singular, neuter, uh, dative singular, personal, masculine, and then dative singular, uh, neuter. The reason they'll show you masculine versus neuter is if it's typically a person who's the object versus a thing that's the object. That's that's what that's uh, showing you. All right, so let's look up some common verbs together. Hava. Here we read pret havdi, subj hevdi, pressing heavy, less correctly heavier, 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 plural hivim havit hava, 
the mod press saying is monosyllabic hever, hever and is used so and etc etc. What's going on here? First of all, typically the first thing you're going to see in your verb entries is guidance on how to inflect them. So by showing us that the preterite, that means past, is havdi, we can see that this isn't, for example, an A-type, right? It's not havadi. Uh, the sub showing us the subjunctive shows us that it has I mutation in the past subjunctive from something like havdi for the normal past tense or hevdi for the subjunctive past tense. You can figure out the other past tense endings. Um, typically, uh, he'll show you the third person or the first person um, so that you can figure out the rest of the endings because usually uh, he'll remark if there's anything else unusual. Present singular heavy, then he says less correctly heavier and then shows us heavier, heavier. What he's doing here is showing us the full present tense inflection saying that it quote should be ek heavy, not ek heavier. Of course, the reason why he points that out at all is that there are some late, especially Norwegian Old Norse texts, where the uh, third person singular ending leaks into the first person singular. I don't know why he feels like he has to mention this early on in the entry for a basic verb. Why confuse the issue? You're never going to see that in classical Old Norse texts as you read, but whatever. Then he says plural hovim havit hava. Notice again, using the modern Icelandic spelling O with two dots to stand for okaldata, and then using aggravatingly as hell this T ending instead of ev for the second person plural. I don't know where Guthrie Vickerson got the idea that this was a quote better ending than ev. Ev is the standard ending you'll see in every edition. Um, <laughs> it's actually, you know, the Laut Gazetsleisch, the expected ending uh, by sound change, but he got fixated on putting T's everywhere. Um, so just know that in every edition and in my lessons and such, it's going to be Havid, not Havid. <sighs> and then he says, the modern present singular is monosyllabic hever or hever. That's actually not monosyllabic in modern Icelandic. But anyway, he just wants to um, discourage you from thinking that a form like hever or hever is, quote unquote, uh, correct Old Norse. All right, let's look at something about, um, let's, let's, let's think about another really common verb. How about um, gera, uh, right, to do? Well, we look this up and we see gera, and then we see a little ev. That means that this is an I-type weak verb, right? So again, he's showing us that it's not past tense like han gera thee, but rather past tense han ger thee, right? This is what you add to the root before you add the past tense endings. Uh, that's the most important inflectional information that a verb entry can give you, at least a weak verb entry. And he says to do, and then he says vide, gyra. Vide means go see this other one. So we look up gyra, which is not a particularly common variant of this verb in Old Norse. Um, yeah, you see it, uh, but I, I still think gyra is more common in, in Old Icelandic. So we see gyra, then again the ev to show you that this is a I type, not an A type weak verb. Also spelt gerva, gerva, gera, 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 which great. <laughs> a lot of these are pretty rare, um, and you're definitely not going to see them in standardized Old Norse texts, which are what most beginners can be reading. Properly gera, so showing us that this o with two dots that he's using stands for the i mutated short o, not the u mutated short a. Not gora. Now that way that he's writing the vowel there as an O with a loop off of an A is an archaic way of writing the O caudata vowel. Right, the loop on O caudata comes from the loop of an A. Um, and he writes the Y was sounded nearly as Y or EY and the Y he's referring to is the Y way back in the variant that he mentioned uh, Gura. So the G is to be sounded as aspirate however okay anyway what i want to show you is that he gets real bogged down in showing you variants and the variant that he picks is not necessarily the most common variant let's look at another common verb how about a strong verb fara here we see preterite fora which is wrong <laughs> second person uh fort uh modern force post plural foru present fair, second person fair, 
and modern pronunciation fer, preterite subjunctive fara, imperative far, farthu equals farthu, uh, supine farit, participle farin, with the suffix negative fora, uh, faridad, part not, etc. All right, what's going on here? First of all, pret again means past tense. He's showing you what uh, the past tense form would be, but it's actually for. He's gotten ahead of himself and put the negative suffix on this. Um, second person fort, modern forced. This is a, I, I guess it's sort of useful that it shows you the modern Icelandic forms where, where they're different. But then it gets over here to showing us preterite subjunctive, past tense subjunctive. Fara, remember that the past tense subjunctive is formed from the past tense plural endings and there is no umlaut or mutation relationship between long O and ash. So this is quote unquote really Führer, he's not going to tell you that. I guess he assumes you're going to figure that out for yourself. Imperat stands for imperative, right? The command form. Sup stands for supine. That means the neuter past participle. And then what he calls the participle is showing you the masculine form. And then for some reason, he always obsesses about showing you the suffix negative forms like fora, faritha. You see that in poetry a lot, for example, in Havamal, where these ahs get added or ats get added to... Uh, make a verb negative, but I, you know, you could just learn that and not show these and take up space in a verb entry. Let's look at an A-type weak verb, kala. So here we see ad, so that shows us that this is an A-type by showing us that that's what you add to the root before you add the past tense endings. Then of course it's gotta show us with negative suffix, present kaliga, I call not. Why is this the most important thing to show us? Kala ra, it's another negative suffix. Uh, an old, an, an Anglo-Saxon, Old English, uh, Kalion occurs once, the poem Beer and Oath, it's not what it's called anymore, and uh, Bildekal and Exodus, but in both instances the word is Danish. The word, however, occurs in Old High German, Kalon, Modern High German, Kala, but only in the sense to talk loud, and it is lost in Modern German. To call, cry, shout, where es, where er, so Karl, Karla, Karla, um, Vogen, etc., etc. Okay, um, he does well in these etymologies sometimes. Uh, Cleese B. Vixen is actually not the best dictionary for etymologies. Some of Cleese Brown Vixen's ideas about etymology are a little bit fanciful. They're okay here, but uh, take his etymologies often with a little bit of a grain of salt. Let's look at a preterite present verb. Vita, a verb whose present is in a preterite form. Okay, it's just telling you it's a preterite present. See grammar page 23. Present, vait, vaitst, vaitstu, vait, plural, vitum, vitu, vitu. Later and modern vitith vita, the latter form, appears in vellums early in the 14th century, e.g. their vituth. From the full to pret, preterit, past tense, visa, visir, visi, never visti, compare Gothic wissa, modern Danish vitsta. Subjunctive present vita, preterit, i.e. past tense visa, imperative vit, vitu, participle vitither, vitin, horn clovey, with negative suffix, vetat, knows not, vet ka ek, what I not I. Vetsatu, vituma, we know not. Visit, knew not. Ulf. All right, so here he's getting into uh, etymologies, and this is a pretty typical etymological entry. Ulf means Ulfla, so he's showing you the Gothic, Witan. And then he shows you the Greek word that Wolfelhaus translates with that, which is helpful if you know Greek. So eat, ate, and I, like, like no, Gignoskein, no. Anglo Saxon, a Halion. Halion being the major work of Old Saxon, that's how he's usually going to cite Old Saxon. Witan, English wit, German Vissen, Danish Lila, Swedish Vita, Latin Vitere, Greek Edenai. Then we get to definition to wit, have sense, be conscious, which he could use, you know, the, the normal word in English, which is no, but he has to start with these archaic words that are cognate, so like wit, you know, nobody says that. Certainly no one says what I, not I, like this example here. What is an old, very archaic English way of saying no, I what. So, um, again, he starts off this entry with showing you his grammatical forms, which is pretty useful. It gives you the whole present, veit, veits, uh, the veits do in parentheses is the question form, right, with a thu affixed to the, to the verb. Um, he wants to show you some later and modern forms like vitith and vitan instead of vitu vitu because, quote, the latter form appears in vellums early in the 14th century. There he's kind of justifying some changes that have happened in modern Icelandic as being fairly old. 
And this is a guy who feels like he needs to justify anything has changed from his sort of ideal assignment. Um, notice also, he says to go look at the grammar in the front of the book. Um, the verbs part of the grammar starts on page 22, if you're using the pagination of the original dictionary. Um, remember that he's going to give the second plural endings as T's rather than as. Um, and by the way, when he mentions the modern changes, starting on page 26, he's not even going to mention <laughs> that the second person plural ending is as, not T. Oh, God. It's, 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 it's just so finicky and weird and eccentric. This dictionary could have been so much better. But uh, it's useless to get excited about something made 150 years ago, I guess. Let's, let's do one more uh, verb entry, actually, before I get to um, noun. Spiria. Present. Spear, spirium, plural. Spur the... He means past, right? This isn't... This is a, one of these stupid typos that you get all over this book. Um, you have to be able to recognize spur the is a past tense, right? Not a plural. So you just got to roll with it and, and, and know where to correct this guy. Subjunctive spear the, imperative spear, spear the... Participle spur the sport, a participle spornum is from a strong verb spur in. And modern usage sounded as with u throughout, thus infinitive spiria, press spear, imperative spear thou, with negative suffix spiria to spear thou not in a verse. Um, in the etymology section where the square bracket starts spore, what he's showing you is the root that it's from, which is spore, like a, a track, like an animal's track. Uh, he shows you words that's related to Anglo Saxon. Sporion, Scottish and Northern English spear, which nobody says, but he's kind of define it using that. German Spuren, Swedish Spuria Spuren. The track, the tree steps or footprints. He gives us our first definition, which for some reason is B, not A. Two, metaphorical, the track, investigate, find out, and shows us some examples. And then Roman numeral two, to spear, ask, absolutive or with genitive. <laughs> Just say ask, dude. And this is one of those places where you have to be ready for his weird English. Let's look at some noun entries. Mother. Now, after the, typically the first information, unless Keith brander has got some kind of a axe to grind, the first information you can see in a noun entry is M, F, or N, meaning masculine, feminine, or neuter. Useful, right? And then typically he's going to show you... Um, uh, grammatical forms if the grammatical forms are different from the most common paradigms. So like your A stem um, masculine or, or neuter noun or your mixed long O stem, I stem, feminine nouns. Basically the first paradigms that I teach in my Old Norse lesson series for masculine and feminine, he's not going to comment about. So if you just find a masculine, feminine, or a neuter and there's no further information about grammar, it's going to be that type. So for example, Oh, before I get to, ha to mother, hav, right? And you see in, meaning neuter. Um, he says Swedish hav, oh, pretty full-fashioned spelling of the Swedish. Danish how, formed from heavy to lift, Scandinavian word, which seems not to occur in Saxon or German. Saxon meaning like Old English, Old, old Saxon. The sea, especially the high sea. Okay, but here, since he didn't give you any additional grammatical information, you can assume that hav just works as a normal neuter noun, right? Hav, 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 et etc. But mother, of course, there's some weird grammatical stuff going on with that. So we see masculine, QS, which means like, which is, right? So he's saying sort of like, really, underlyingly, it is moner, which form also occurs in old poets, Angi, Moner, Unrani. He's inferring that from rhymes. Not crazily, but it's not a form you're going to see in standard editions. For the change of NN before R into S, see the introduction to letter N. Then he gives you genitive mon, state of mani. Accusative mon, plural, that is nominative plural, men, which is to say mener, with the article menenir, so always in old writers, but a modern menenir, erroneously. <laughs> Anything he doesn't like about modern Icelandic is an error. As if from mener. The plural mether, answering to the singular mother, occurs in old poets. Mether, vitu, othling, othra, you men know higher prince. And first. So he, here he's showing you all these obscure forms you're never going to see. Nor the mether, roa, nathri, mether, fengu, make it feather. Here is Mether Vedia, all verses of the 11th to 12th centuries, and Mether Mirkvith Kala, Mether Flutusor. God, so many examples of this thing you're not going to see. Genitive plural, mana, dative 
upon him, accused of men. Ballads and Reamer after the 15th century and hence an ecclesiastical writings of, writers of later times, a nominative man has now been used, especially in compounds influenced by German and English, e.g. Christiman, or for the sake of rhyme, at la thueki al merman, of comas munis graflas strafas han. Anyway, then he gives you Gothic, Ulfalas, mana equals the Greek anthropos man, and other Teutonic, i.e. Germanic languages, spelled man, or better, man. Always judgmental. And then the definition, a man equals Latin homo, Greek anthropos, also people, and then gets into all the examples. So just, you know, um, when I make Old Norse glossaries, like for my eventual Old Norse textbook or or, or for students in lessons, I, I don't get bogged down on all of these strange uh, ancillary things, but boy, he likes to. Uh, let's look at another where his obsessions affect, uh, which you're going to read in an entry. Thok, feminine, genitive, thakar, plural, thakir. What that shows you is that this is a normal type feminine noun, right? So it's going to go thok, thok, thakar, thoka, thoku, plural, thakir, thakir, thaka, thokum. Um, but he wants to remind you that the I mutation happens, right? That the O caudata, or what he writes as O2 dots, is not the, the root vowel, which is useful information, uh, just to be to be clear about that. Uh, then he shows us, this one he starts with etymology, so Ulfalas, i.e. Gothic thonks, equals Greek uh, charis, which means thanks, uh, gives us a biblical reference there. Uh, Anglo-Saxon thonk, English thanks, German donked, uh, Danish tak properly pleasure liking akin to thicker thoki compare latin grati and gratus with grates and greek hara with caris um this is it, 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 it never means this <laughs> right even the example that it gives um do do something to thanks to, to someone's liking it's, it's it's to do something to to be thanked by somebody uh lay something well in thanks or in thought. I guess that is sort of the thought meaning, but but usually, he then says, Roman numeral two, thanks. That's what it always freaking means. So, because there's an etymological connection to think, he's got to start off with this obscure definition that you're not going to see very often. Um, even in freaking Gothic, thanks means thanks, as illustrated by the very example that he cites from Luke 17.9. If you get the sense that I get exasperated with this dictionary, you're correct. It's still a useful tool. You still ought to be able to use it. All right, let's look at some more nouns. Sar, masculine. There are three forms. Sar, sior, sior, compare, snar, slayer, etc. In old writers, sar is common. A sior in modern, sior is the most rare. The V, also written F, appears in genitive, savar, siovar, siovar, dative, savvy, siovi, siovi, accusative, sasio, sio. The dative singular was then shortened into sasio sio, which forms prevail in prose. In modern usage, the V has also been dropped between two vowels, sior for siovar, plural sior for siovir, dative sioum. Genitive sios is only used in special phrases and is borrowed from the Danish. Ulfalas, a Gothic saus, marisaus, uh, Greek limne, which means lake, uh, Anglo Saxon sang, which see Old High German seo, German ze, Danish su, not how this was spelled anymore, Swedish. Sure. The sea, the sea, never used like German say of a lake. Blah, 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 blah. All right, so here we have a form where legitimately there's a lot of different grammatical variation, right? Um, based on some sound changes that affected different uh, grammatical cases of this word, uh, there are a lot of different variations in Old Norse. So uh, that's legitimately good information for him to give you there. And of course, giving you all of these different grammatical forms. Um, you know, plural siovir, uh, although I think the typical plural is siovar. Uh, it's, it's, it's useful to, to call this out. Uh, so then something with some unexpected grammatical endings like retter. Here we see masculine, genitive retar. That shows you it's an I stem, right? If it didn't comment about it, we'd know it was an A stem. It would just do the normal ret, ret, rets. Reti, but this is an I stem, so it's going to retter, ret, reta, reti, 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 reta, retum. He's not typically going to give you the whole inflection, but it can at least have you be ready for it to show I stem forms. If you want the whole inflection, you're going to have to look like a, look at an old Norse grammar, like Gordon, 
or uh, Barnes and Fox or Eversion if you can read Norwegian or um, another place you can check is bin.arnestolfman.is where you can see the modern Icelandic grammar but uh, it's often the same grammatical forms as in Old Norse um, with some obvious changes like how modern Icelandic uses you are where Old Norse just uses an R. Uh, all right. So this gives you, I think, a pretty good introduction to what noun and verb entries look like. Um, look at a couple others that aren't nouns and verbs. So adjectives, so for example, aller, ul, alt, and alt adjective. Typically, he's not going to give you inflectional forms for an adjective because they're all the same. Here, he's just being extra clear. This is what the feminine looks like with mutation. This is what the neuter looks like with two L's or one L. Um, sometimes he splits words that I wouldn't split and doesn't split words that I would. So, for example, if you want to look up N, which means still, E-N-N, -N, you're going to see him, first of all, showing you article V equals hen. Now, hen is actually a really late form. He in in is a pretty standard Old Norse form. Um, so I don't know why he lists it under hen when he insists on all these other archaic forms. But then e n n meaning still, it says v means c, right? V day, c n e n. Okay, well, if I go and I look up e n, I see disjunctive con conjunction. That's a fancy way of saying but, b u t. In MSS, that means manuscripts, spelled either e n or e n n. He gives us a little bit of. Uh, Etymology. By the way, when he says Norse, he means modern Norwegian. That's what he. That's why he's citing Ivar Osen, who um, gathered all the information about modern Norwegian dialects that led to the creation of the modern Norwegian spelling system called Nynorsk. And he gives us the definition. But now down a ways, he gives us the definition yet still. And you might notice. That in all of the yet and still examples, it's spelled E-N-N, -N, and in all of the but examples, it's spelled E-N. Whether or not these are etymologically one word, Guthbrander, they are used in Old Norse and Modern Icelandic as different words. E-N meaning but, and E-N-N -N meaning still. But he doesn't do that. He doesn't heed that. And then now, now what if I want to look up a really common word like, like some? Old Norse is usually nokr, which I'd expect him to spell nukr, and Modern Icelandic nukr. But if we look that up, we get redirected to Nekfer, a form you never see except in something like the Stockholm homily book, some of the most archaic prose preserved in Old Norse. Oh, and then there's about a column spread out over two pages explaining the evolution of all the different spellings this word takes, concluding with a definition and examples that all use the more common spellings, Nok and Nek. Meanwhile, because of the atrocious decision to alphabetize it under Nek, uh, he gets to derived words like nokernich as the first new vocabulary on page 452, which means that the head words on page 452 go nokernich to nema, which is crazy. He's just so fixated <laughs> on what he thinks these, things, these words ought to look like, and it drives me crazy, and it means that the alphabetization looks wrong. Well, let's conclude this video by looking at uh, some sentences in Old Norse and considering what we might do with the Cleesby Vickerson Dictionary to look up some difficult words. I'm not going to consider all the words, only the, the ones that might be a little bit harder. So in the sentence, Odin skifti homum, lotho bukren sem solven eva dauder. Uh, this is from Ingling Saga. We see uh, skifti. What is that? If we look up skifti, we're not going to see that. Now, if we know a little bit of Old Norse, we might know that T is a third person singular past tense verb ending for I type weak verbs. Odin being the nominative form of the god's name, this certainly seems like a verb that has Odin as its subject. Now, if we look up skippa, we'll find a verb that we see in the entry in Cleesby Vigerson is followed by a. That means it's an A type weak verb, so we'd expect skippa thee rather than skip thee. So we know this isn't our verb. Then we have to remember that Old Norse has a rule that when three consonants come in sequence, the middle one, especially if it's identical to one of the other ones, will drop. So we might consider that a verb skipta 
would have a past third person singular skip the two if it's an I type. And indeed, that's what we find when we look up a verb skip the, where we see a T. Um, that means that that's its, uh, its, its past tense formant. That's what we add the past tense endings to. And because of that rule about three constants in Old Norse, that skift to T would just become skift D. And that means make a division of a thing, shift, change, and we see with dative. So that means uh, that the object will be dative. And of course, the following noun we see is dative with um, right? The dative plural ending for all nouns. Now, if we look up what heel spell we know is O with two dots, right? O cal data we're going to find a feminine noun that means ham or haunch of a horse. Now that's not a particularly likely thing for Odin to make a division of or shift or change, but we ought to remember always that use mutate A's into Oka data. So we ought to look up ham, H-A-M. If we look up just plain H-A-M, we're not going to find anything, but we will, if we remember that the typical masculine noun ending is R, find something under hammer. There we see hammer masculine and it's something like skin, right? So Odin changed skins, changed shape. All right. Uh, that fourth word, law, if we look up just law, we'll find a feminine noun meaning shoreline. Um, not particularly common and maybe if we're looking ahead a little bit, doesn't seem to fit our context very well, that we can keep it in the back of our minds. Then we might find there's a verb, law. We see that that entry uh, the, the first thing we see there is lo e, which shows us it's an I type weak verb. I don't know why he starts it with the present rather than the past tense there, but it at least shows us what type of verb it is. Uh, that means blame, but then that would be an infinitive or a third person plural present. So that, that doesn't seem to make any sense of what we've got going on here. You know, your intuition ought to always be that a small, unexpected word that you can't find in the dictionary is a weird verb form. Happily, this dictionary. And also the Zawega Dictionary, that's kind of a uh, summary form of the Guthbrander Vixen Dictionary, has a, uh, a list of, of common irregular verb forms. And if you look under the verbs that start with an L, because very few sound changes would cause the first uh, letter of a word to change, unless it's a V, uh, we'll find Ligia, and we'll see that the third person singular form of Ligia is lo, le. And so there we will find uh, this is le, so his body lay as if it were dead or asleep. Now I did that whole previous sentence uh, in my original video about this from late 2016, so I may append that at the end of this one because I just don't have time. And, uh, to go through the entire thing and, uh, you know, maybe the greater detail into which I went with each single word in that one back when I had more life in me will be useful to you. But let's look at another sentence with some difficult words. Consider how to get them. This is from the Saga of the Volsungs. Lungvi konungur sukur nu til konungsbuerins og atlar takathar konungsdotur and thought brosk honum. Now that's how I would print that sentence, but if you're reading another edition, uh, a word like sukir, you might see spelled with the OE ligature, you might see it spelled with ash, if it's a more modern Icelandic adjacent spelling system. Same thing with the letter, the vowel and konungsbjörns. Um, and then that second to last word, brosk, in many editions you'll see that as brost right, with the modern Icelandic ending, which uh, Guthrander is really inconsistent about whether he prefers the SK or the ST ending for medio passive verbs. But a couple hard words here to find maybe might be like number six. Now, your average word in Old Norse is a two-syllable trochee, right? So, konungs looks like an Old Norse word, boyar looks like an Old Norse word, and you would be right, that's how they are split. Konungs looking like it's genitive. Of course, it's a pretty common word, right? Kings. Um, the next word also looks like it's genitive because we have the article ints, which is in its genitive singular masculine or neuter form. That ought to tell you, of course, that's expected because 
uh, till, ticks of objects, so sucker till, seeks to, uh, right, goes to, tries to find, sometimes attacks. Uh, that ought to tell you then that ar is a genitive singular ending. Now we know that can be a genitive singular ending, uh, more often on feminines, but on some masculines and, and vanishingly few neuters like fefior. But if we just take that ending off, ar, that leaves us with buyi, and no Old Norse noun ends in J. But we might remember that in some nouns, there is a J or a V that surfaces before endings that start with vowels, and that's exactly what's happening here. So we might consider the root then as B and look at B. Now we're not gonna find a neuter noun B, but if we look for that with the masculine nominative sending, singular ending R, which we know it has to be masculine or neuter because of the form of the article, it's not in R, it's ints, we will in fact find, if we remember to look under Cleesby Vickvison's ash for a long O slash, we're going to find bar, bur, beer. So we're going to see this is the king's town. Now another word that might be kind of hard is the very last one, not the very last one, the second to last one, brosk. Now the closest thing you'll see in the dictionary if you just look that up in that form is bra, feminine for eyelid, but there's no noun ending sk or st. Now, we might remember that sk, or again in later texts, st, is a medio passive or reflexive verb ending. So, this might be a good place to check our list of irregular strong verb forms early in the dictionary, or on my Patreon, or, or uh, on, in your own notes. And if you didn't remember it, you will find there that uh, if you look under those verbs that start with B, bro is the past tense third singular form of bregda, which is has a lot of different meanings, change, draw, uh, make a quick motion, etc. But you have to read pretty far if you look up bregda in the Cleesby Vixen Dictionary to see the meaning that's used here, which is under number three, where we see reflexive, right, it's the SK, the SD endings, we see bregdask em, meaning bregdask with a personal object, personal pronoun, or person's name, or title, or something in the dative, or absolute to deceive, fail, with examples like in them brosk from hepid, they failed in the onslaught. So there we can see from that being exactly uh, parallel with what we're seeing in this example sentence from the Saga of the Volsungs, but uh, he failed in it. Obviously not something that we would normally expect uh, from Honum, you know, translating that as a, as a subject. But it's parallel with the form in the dictionary here. And if you don't trust him for etymologies, and if you get frustrated at him, as I do, for his archaic English and his super persnickety ideas about how Icelandic is better if it's archaic this way but modern that way, and, I don't know, he's just an eccentric guy, but I can't kiss the first stone. And he's been dead for 150 years, and no one's going to read anything that I wrote 150 years from now. So, you know, I respect you, Guth Brander Vickerson. I just don't always understand you. And I have to admit that your dictionary has, of all the complete dictionaries in Old Norse anyway, the best, uh, most comprehensive definitions. Uh, it is semantically the best dictionary, even if it's not etymologically, or shall I say, morphologically, the best dictionary imaginable, but nothing's perfect. All right, well, that was a long video. I'll be surprised if anyone's listened all this way, but I hope that anyone who's used any part of it has a better understanding of how to read Old Norse using a dictionary like the famous C.V. Cleesby Vickerson. For now, beautiful Colorado. Let me wish you all the best. Just 10 words. But if we don't know Old Norse very well yet, these 10 words can still be a big challenge. So let's number them first. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, two. All right. So number one, Odin. We can tell right away this is the subject because
this is a masculine noun with a root that ends in n. So the nominative r that marks it as a subject assimilates at the n and becomes a second n. So we know Othan is a subject. Othan is doing something. For number two, skipti. We recognize probably right away that that t is a past tense third person singular ending for an I type weak verb. So we might think, well, uh, let's look up a verb skip a, right? That might be in the infinitive that we would get out of this. So we go to the Cleesby Ficklesen dictionary. And we see, in fact, a verb skip a, but it is followed immediately by this little sign in the Cleesby Ficklesen dictionary. This is showing us that the past tense of this verb is formed with a, so this is an a type weak verb. This means that the past tense of this verb is skipathy. If it had said this, which it doesn't, with a t, that means that t is the past tense format for this verb. Uh, but it doesn't say that, so we know this is not the verb that we need. All right, so it's not this skip a verb. What might it be? Well, we might remember that this T ending is by default an ev i ending. It's the. It only changes the T because of the influence of a consonant that is or was there. One of the main consonants that can influence an ev to turn into a T is a T. So maybe we need to look for skip top. And in fact, we check skipta and we see a verb listed this way. That shows us that the verb is skipta, the past tense is formed with T. So we might expect it to look something like this. But Old Norse will usually get rid of one of two consonants that's the same when it's next to another consonant, giving us skipti. Now, under the definition for skipta, as under the definition for any other word in the Cleesby Vigerson, you're going to see a lot. The Cleesby Vigerson dictionary includes a lot of etymology, so it also uh, shows you related forms and other languages in the Indo European family. Uh, as well as specific examples of the word being used in its different contexts and meanings. It can look a little overwhelming, but look for in italics the actual uh, dictionary definitions. Under those italics, the first one you'll see for this verb is make a division of a thing, and the second that you'll see under this verb is to shift or change. So let's find out what word number three is and keep those definitions in mind. All right, three. So under those definitions for skipta, make a division of a thing or shift or change, it says with dative. That means that the object of this verb is in the dative rather than the accusative, which is kind of our default object case. Well, that's fine because we see that this next noun ends in um, which is the dative plural ending for all types of nouns. So no problem, we know this is a dative plural noun, homo. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we know what it means. So let's go to Cleesby Vickerson and let's look up just this root, let's look up hom. Remembering that that hook O will be spelled O with two dots in Cleesby Vickerson. So we look this up and we see that this is the uh, ham or haunch of a horse. Well, that seems unusual in this context that Odin would be splitting or changing the uh, haunch of a horse. So let's go and see if we can find a better fit. Remember that a U in Old Norse will always change an A, a short A, in the preceding syllable into a hook O. 
So we also need to look not just for this, but for this. We won't find anything under hom, but then what does a masculine noun typically end in in the nominative singular? It typically ends in an R. And under hammer, we will find uh, another noun. When we find this in the dictionary, we'll see a little M after it, just like after whom. We'll see a little F. We would also see a little N if it were neuter. So the little M stands for masculine, the F is for feminine, N is for neuter, so we know what gender the word is. Homer, we would assume, was masculine anyway because it ends in R in the nominative singular. And Homer means skin. So we can now read the first three words, Odin changed skins. He changed shape. All right. So moving along, we look at the fourth word, lo. If we go straight to the dictionary and look this up, we're going to see a couple possibilities. There is a noun, lo, which means shoreline, and there is a verb, lo, and the dictionary will show us that its present tense form is loi, that shows us that it's a I-type weak verb, loi, loi, or loi, and this means to, uh, to blame like to uh, cast blame on somebody. So these are two possibilities, but notice that this is the infinitive of this verb that's matching up to this, or the third person present plural, right, that they do something for. There doesn't seem to be a they to do anything here. There's no nominative plural subject, so it doesn't seem like it could be this verb. Also shoreline, you know, if we just take a quick a uh, glance at what's following. There doesn't seem to be a whole lot of context that would support this shoreline reading. So probably neither one of these is going to match up with what this verb, this word actually is. So let's come back to it. Let's get clear about what the other words in the sentence mean before we come back and make a decision about what law means. Keep in mind too that this is a good place to remember that your intuition should always be that if you come across a small unfamiliar word it is probably a weird verb form. Old Norse is full of verbs that have unusual, kind of unexpected forms. Uh, let's go ahead and put it in the back of our mind that this is a weird verb form, probably. Okay. Moving on to word five. Full. Full means then. It is one of the commonest words in the language. Thor can also be the masculine accusative plural them, but there doesn't seem to be any kind of a verb uh, here that would affect a, a them. So it's a safe assumption that this is just then, okay? Six, Bukurin. Just looking at this, we should probably recognize that this is a masculine noun with its nominative singular ending, so it's a subject of a verb and that it has the article in on it. So this is the uh, something. And when we look it up, we're not disappointed to see that bukur is a masculine noun and it means body or trunk, as in trunk of a body. So the body then something. All right, seven sem, sem, in Old Norse means as or as if. It has a lot more meanings uh, in modern Icelandic where it's a somewhat more important word, but we don't have to think about that for Old Norse. So then the body something as if. All right, eight, solven. We might be tempted looking at this to say, well, this is a masculine noun with the article. It would probably be nominative, because we haven't seen a verb yet that would put this into the accusative. Uh, in which case, this would be a weak masculine noun, something like solvi. But if we look that up in the dictionary, we won't find anything. So, whenever you see an ending that looks like the definite article, but doesn't seem to 
be the definite article attached to any noun that you can find. A good second guess is that this is a past participle of a verb. We haven't really talked about past participles in my Old Norse uh, lesson series, but uh, their endings, at least for strong verbs like solva, are almost identical to the endings of the definite article v. So solven is the past participle of the verb solva, sleep. And the past participle is a kind of adjectival form of the verb, in this case, asleep. So then the body something as if asleep. Nine, eða means simply or. And ten, we've got an adjective ending in r, that's its masculine nominative singular form, exactly the form we'll find it in the dictionary. Doither, deuther, dead. So then the body blank as if asleep or dead after Odin changed shapes. All right, this is all making pretty good sense. So what are we going to do to go back and make four fit in and make good sense? Well, like I said, our assumption should be, since this is a weird little word that we can't figure out immediately, that it's an irregular verb form. Both the Cleesby Vixen and the Gerzewig dictionaries include a list of strong and irregular verbs that show all of their principal parts. So if we go to that list of verb forms, usually located uh, either close to the beginning or the close close to the end of the dictionary at the online Cleesby uh, Vixen dictionary at the University of Pennsylvania. It will be one of the first pages you can click on. Uh, it says uh, alphabetical list of verbs. Let's just look at all the ones that start with L because it's unlikely that the first letter of the verb would change in any of its forms. We will find a verb ligia to lie down and we will see in this alphabetical list of verbs with all their regular forms that the past third person singular is the which makes perfect sense here so now we can read Odin changed skins lay then the body the trunk of his body as if asleep or dead and now we can read our ten words in Old Norse notice that the word order is not perfectly like English uh, here the verb is beginning this clause, which is not unusual because it's following another clause. Old Norse will often vary up the word order a little bit that way, but you can still tell what the subject is because it's going to be in the nominative. All right. Well, this is not a traditional classroom, and I've been somewhat surprised by how many people have followed along with the Old Norse lesson series. I'm honored. Um, but because it's not a classroom, I can't just give you homework and grade it. Uh, however, uh, on my Patreon page that's associated with these YouTube videos, I will uh, load my own kind of version of this list of irregular verb forms with the commonest verbs that have irregular forms so that you can look up uh, those pretty quickly. And then uh, I will also put uh, a page from the Klesi Vigaswan Dictionary with my sort of dissection of it to show you like how to read the entries because sometimes it can be a little overwhelming with all the extra information that's on a page of Cleesby Vickerson. So those will be uh, special content on my Patreon page for Patreon supporters. And then in the next video in Unit 2 of the Old Norse series, I'm going to look at words that are commonly mistaken for one another, words that have a lot of meanings, and talk about how to develop the right intuitions about what they mean. Words like thol, which can mean then or them, for instance. All right. Well, as usual, thank you very much for your time and from the University of California, Berkeley, all the best to you.